holy warrior. Osama bin Laden is both a feared and bloodthirsty killer and a revered spiritual leader. Bin Laden's father was one of the people who really built the modern Saudi Arabia. The bin Laden family has become the most wealthy family in Saudi Arabia outside of the royal family. Mohammed bin Laden raises a family of moderate Muslims. But a hedonistic trip to Beirut begins to radicalize young Osama. He went to Beirut in Lebanon when he was a young man in his teens. Beirut at the time was known as the Paris of the East. It was a very decadent, very exciting city. A repentant bin Laden returns to Saudi Arabia to continue his studies. Preparing to join the family business, he pursues a degree in engineering. Osama bin Laden worked as an engineer, supervising construction projects during his breaks from university. Back at school, bin Laden joins a militant Islamic organization called the Muslim Brotherhood. In December 1979, Soviet troops invaded Afghanistan. Muslim governments and clergymen declared a holy war, or jihad, against the infidels. And thousands of young Muslims heeded the call, including bin Laden. In 1989, with the help of American weapons and a great deal of resolve, the Russians are finally forced to withdraw. It is a success for bin Laden, with far-reaching consequences. After Afghanistan, anything seems possible. The only thing that counts, says Abdallah Azam, is willpower. Victory is a moment of revelation, especially for bin Laden. Today, the jihad is a duty for the Muslim nation. It is possible that some cannot fulfill this duty due to certain disabilities. But those who fought in Afghanistan know with the simplest means, some landmines, Kalashnikovs, or rocket launchers, you can overwhelm and destroy legends. The biggest military machine in the world has been destroyed. Henceforth, the expression, superpower, has lost its meaning. And we are convinced that America is even weaker than Russia. Bin Laden is now transformed from a young Saudi rich kid into a war hero. Osama bin Laden starts to regard himself as invincible. Jihad is his mission, but for now, the 33-year-old returns home to Saudi Arabia. A crucial transformational issue for him, transforming his personality in many ways, was the success in Afghanistan and the idolizing support of his leaders. I would see what happened in Afghanistan as being almost an explosion of narcissistic supplies. He had triumph. Bin Laden's great triumph is followed by his first defeat. On August 2nd, 1990, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. Bin Laden personally implores the Saudi king not to allow U.S. troops onto holy Muslim soil. Mujahideen should liberate Kuwait. The royal family mocks Bin Laden and he leaves for Pakistan before the Saudi government can arrest him. He then launches a public campaign against the ruling Saudi family. After a short stay in Pakistan, bin Laden accepts an offer to move to Sudan, which was controlled by pious Muslims after a coup in 1989. Over a thousand former Mujahideen would follow bin Laden to Sudan. The multi-millionaire purchases several houses close to Khartoum airport, among them his own relatively modest villa. Today, Sudanese intelligence is said to own bin Laden's residence, and filming is prohibited. Bin Laden didn't dwell in luxury while living here, but as his former cook recalls, he entertained a constant flow of visitors. Bin Laden's visitors come from most Islamic countries. Officially, he is viewed as a hard-working entrepreneur, establishing over 30 companies. The Sudanese government exploits the Saudi millionaire as a mobile bank, and he revitalizes the city of Khartoum by building roads, an airport, and other projects. This mosque near his residence is where Osama bin Laden prayed five times a day. He mixed with the other worshipers and strictly declined repeated invitations from the imam to hold sermons himself. The Saudi is not considered a very erudite Muslim, simply a very devout one. 
Nobody in this mosque remembers hearing any of his later tirades of hate against the West and the Jews. Every Muslim wishes for an example like Osama bin Laden. He provides a good example. He respects the teachings of our Prophet Muhammad. He's very modest, even in his clothing and in his food. New York, February 1993. The city is shaken by an event that is later viewed as the prelude to September 11th. A powerful bomb detonates in the underground garage of the World Trade Center's North Tower. Six people die, many are wounded. Omar Abdel Rahman, also known as the Blind Sheikh, appears to have instigated the attack. He knows bin Laden from Peshawar, Pakistan. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, shown here at his arrest, provided the financial backing for his nephew. The extent of bin Laden's involvement in the attack remains a mystery. Bin Laden uses media outlets to promote an increasingly bloody vision. February 1998, bin Laden announces a new multinational terrorist alliance at a press conference with Egyptian doctor Amin al-Zawahiri. Bin Laden held a meeting to announce a new crusade and a new alliance of radical Islamic groups under the Al-Qaeda banner. The new alliance declares that good Muslims must kill Americans wherever they can. His goal is basically to get us out of the region. His argument was that all of these governments are tyrannies and they exist because of their friendship with the United States to keep oil prices at below market levels. He's soft-spoken. But the words, the words he was using, uh, were extremely powerful and frightening. He had three principal issues. One was to remove the U.S. military presence from Saudi Arabia. The other was to end the U.S. support of Israel, uh, particularly as it affected negatively the Palestinians. And three was, at that time, an immediate halt to the bombing of Iraq, and even still now today, uh, an end to sanctions that he felt um, adversely affected Iraqi women and children and, and, and innocents. Miller questioned bin Laden about the disturbing fatwa targeting American civilians. Bin Laden fired back. American history does not distinguish between civilians and military, not even women and children. They're the ones who use the bombs against Nagasaki and Hiroshima. The fatwa applies to all those who assist and support in killing the sons of Muslims. Bosnia, 1992. Civil war and ethnic cleansing kill over 200,000 people. Most of the victims are Bosnian Muslims. Sarajevo is under siege and welcomes any assistance offered, including the help of bin Laden and his Afghan Mujahideen. At the beginning of the 90s, over 3,000 fighters are transferred to Bosnia. Jihad has finally come to Europe. Under the watchful eyes of the West, the holy warriors build their European network. For years, the Bosnian government under Ganic and President Izetbegovic denied direct contacts with the holy warriors, but these images prove otherwise. You have fervently protected the people and stood up against the enemy. His path is marked by your martyrs. All over Bosnia, you will still have to face hard fights. Mujahideen are even trained in Bosnian military academies, from bomb-making to urban warfare. Al-Qaeda's future European bridgehead acquires useful terrorist knowledge. The new battlefield in Europe even attracted German faithfuls. The caption reads, his weapon was the camera, on this propaganda video about a German martyr. I would like to point out to the brothers in Germany, and particularly to the German Muslims, that we will be held accountable on the day of final judgment, fight the jihad to remain innocent. At this time, Osama bin Laden was still living in Sudan, though he traveled often to Afghanistan in his private jet. Active in financing the Islamic cause in Bosnia and elsewhere, 
he attracts the attention of the American Secret Services. Since September 1995, bin Laden is the subject of talks between the Americans and the Sudanese and is under close surveillance by U.S. intelligence. In January of 1996, the CIA sets up a special bin Laden unit, and in March of the same year, the White House authorizes the CIA to ask the Sudanese government for information on bin Laden and to press for his expulsion. In May, the Sudanese government asks bin Laden to leave the country. Saudi Arabia declines an extradition offer. And in mid-May, bin Laden lands in Afghanistan with his wives, children, and a following of 150 fighters. Nine months later, President Clinton receives an offer from Sudan. Dear Mr. President, American agents would be welcome at any time in Sudan. But the U.S. does not have sufficient charges to indict bin Laden. Back in Afghanistan, Osama is still considered a war hero. Here, he can rely on old contacts and fall back on his own personal infrastructure. Even while living in Sudan, bin Laden maintained training camps in Afghanistan. Under the protection of the new Taliban government, bin Laden expands his training facilities. And in August of 96, he publishes the famous two-page fatwa against the Americans. This photograph shows him in November of the same year in Tora Bora. The photograph was taken by the publisher of the London-based Arab newspaper Al Quds, who interviewed bin Laden that same month. Bin Laden's troops are tightly organized. Subdivisions are responsible for recruitment, propaganda, and acquisition of intelligence. The bin Laden's growing militia was also becoming increasingly professional as former army officers trained bin Laden's holy warriors. Look, those are the contacts for the battery cable. And this is where you put the viewfinder. The year 1998 brings one of Al-Qaeda's most crucial developments. Bin Laden, his chief strategist Ayman al-Zawahiri, and other radical groups join forces in a single new organization. In February, a press conference is held announcing the foundation of the International Islamic Front for Holy War against the Jews and the Crusaders. The latter refers to the American invaders. For al-Zawahiri and bin Laden, the world is divided into two camps, for or against Islam a questionable religious justification for global terror. On August 7, 1998, two American embassies in East Africa are simultaneously blown up. In Nairobi, Kenya, 247 people die, among them 12 Americans. In neighboring Tanzania, six Africans are killed. The attacks are the first logistically large-scale operation and demonstrate Al-Qaeda's ruthlessness and a turning point in its development. I ordered our armed forces to strike at terrorist-related facilities in Afghanistan and Sudan. The CIA claims it had evidence that nerve gas was being produced at a Sudanese factory, but the owner says it manufactured medicines and is now suing the U.S. government. The retaliation strikes were viewed as a tactical error. The training camps in Afghanistan had already been evacuated in anticipation of the airstrikes. And a public relations blunder. The strikes only enhanced bin Laden's standing in the Arab world, a perfect recruiting tool for al-Qaeda. Hamburg, October 1998. Three young men rent a 200-square-foot apartment in the Marienstrasse in the district of Hamburg, their headquarters for September 11th. The group meets regularly with terrorist sympathizers in Hamburg's Al-Quds Mosque. In October 99, they are wedding guests of their friend Saeed Bahaji, but it's not a very romantic event. The wedding video shows quite a few members of the Hamburg cell. Sitting on the right of the groom, Bahaji, is one of the major plotters of September 11th, Ramzi bin al-Sheib. 
Among the guests, on the floor, the death pilot, Ziad Shara, and on the left, almost unrecognizable, another pilot, Marwan al Shahi. On his left, Abdul Ghani Mzudi, an alleged accomplice. Bin al Shib, one of the celebration's main speakers, talks about the obligation of each Muslim to fight Israel and to liberate Islamic soil from all invaders. Many of the guests already know that this will be their last meeting for some time. The departure for Afghanistan is imminent. Death pilot Marwan al Shahi sings the Song of the Martyr with Abdul Ghani Mzudi. Then everybody calls for jihad. Only six weeks later, Mohammed Atta, Ziad Shara, and Marwan al Shahi travel on different flights to Kabul via Pakistan. Somewhere in the mountains of Kandahar, secret meetings must have taken place with bin Laden and the chief strategist of September 11th, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. As early as the end of 1999, the pilots are selected for the great Holy Tuesday operation. Among them are the members of the Hamburg cell. The group is under direct orders from Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. The preparations for the biggest terrorist attack in history are entering their final stage. The so-called House of Martyrs in Kandahar serves as a training center for other candidates for martyrdom. Among them is the Saudi Mohal al Shari. He will later crash into the South Tower of the World Trade Center. Hijacker of the same flight and seated right next to him is the Saudi Hamza al Hamdi. Of the 19 hijackers, seven are featured in this propaganda video, like Valid Ashari, member of the Mohammed Atta group. On the wall, there's a poster with a phrase in Arabic, the destruction of America. Below is a map of the United States. Yet another assassin, Ahmed Al-Nami, he later crashed with United Airlines Flight 93. In the same plane was the young Saeed Al Hamdi, seen here during training. Saudi Al Umari sat next to Atta in the first plane that hit the North Tower. These men, as bin Laden claims later, not only destroyed the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, but the symbols of the tyrants of our time. Two months after the attacks, the CIA distributes this video. The brothers who conducted the operation, all they knew was that they have a martyrdom operation. And we asked each of them to go to America, but they didn't know anything about the operation, not even one letter. But they were trained, and we did not reveal the operation to them until they are there and just before they boarded the planes. Following the attacks on September 11th, the U.S. strikes Afghanistan with B-52 bombers, attacking bin Laden's cave fortress in the mountains of Tora Bora, near the Pakistan border. But the Al-Qaeda leader survives. to release. This is probably what bin Laden's sleeping and living quarters looked like, a TV books, and a bed, a comfortable space for a cave dwelling. Traveling the road to Tora Bora one year later, bin Laden is gone, but his name is still spoken. Tora Bora, Sheikh Osama bin Laden, Hata. Nobody knows exactly how long bin Laden and his fighters withstood the U.S. attacks. Most likely, they fled Tora Bora the first week of December 2001. These were the first lines of defense. Osama then escaped over the mountains and came down on the other side. Heavily armed Al-Qaeda fighters were everywhere. The fighting lasted one month. We lost many men. And this is what is left of bin Laden's apparent last stay in Afghanistan. Since then, at least according to Western intelligence agencies, the world's most wanted man is hiding somewhere here in the autonomous tribal areas along the Pakistani-Afghan border, or in Pakistani-controlled parts of Kashmir. 
His influence, however, is much broader than his immediate surroundings. Osama bin Laden is the figurehead of Al-Qaeda, but he is not Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda is a phenomenon. Al-Qaeda now is an ideology. Even if Osama bin Laden is killed tomorrow, I don't believe Al-Qaeda will disappear. Al-Qaeda seems to grant its individual cells more and more autonomy, as evidenced by the most recent attacks. Bin Laden is now mostly a symbol. It is a relationship organization. It is people who are brought together because they have a common view of Islam and a willingness to act to implement that. And the organizing force with, behind that has been Laden. This evolution and adaptation has proven deadly as Al-Qaeda claims responsibility for attacks around the world. This is not a war. There'll be one with smart bombs and missiles. Uh, we have youth now, I mean, indeed we have children shouting at the cameras, uh, jihad, jihad, kill the Jews, kill the infidels, kill the Americans, kill the British. Uh, and when hatred is, is steeped in the bone, when hatred is bred in the bone in childhood, this requires a generational change. The West has been shameful, in my judgment, in abdicating the war for hearts and minds. Today, bin Laden is still in hiding. Over 3,000 Al-Qaeda operatives have been caught, but the war on terror continues, just as Al-Qaeda continues to pursue its deadly objective under the watchful eye of Osama bin Laden.